Good morning, church. Everybody all right? All right. I know we're not supposed to do rhetorical questions, but I'm going to do one because I'm an African-American pastor and we talk to people. Amen. 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 Well, we are in this series, uh, Colossians, man, it's been phenomenal. Before I get there, though, um, that bumper video hits on a lot of different things. Hope you caught it. Really, in essence, we are a church on the move. We are a church on the go. And we are a church that longs to live outside the four walls. Matter of fact, this is not the church per se. That may blow some of your minds, but you are the church. Okay, and so with that said, this is just where we meet. This is where we get our game, our game um, play, and we say, ready, break, and let's go. All right? So let's try something real quick. This is normally what I do at Hendersonville. Uh, I'm going to try and see how it works here. I don't know, but it may work. I, I think it will. But I'm going to say this is just a, a huddle, this. And then after I say that, you say, we have to go play the, no, I'm going to take that back. Let me help you all a little better. This is just a huddle. We have to go play the game. There it is. There it is. Y'all ready? So this is just a, we have to go play the game. That's it. And so with that said, we desire as a church uh, to make disciples who reach up in and out uh, of Jesus Christ. And so in essence, a part of that is mobilizing people and then really advancing the gospel, but also investing in the next generation. So our student uh, ministry, they'll be heading off to camp tomorrow. All right, so give it up for that. I'm excited. So they'll be heading to camp uh, tomorrow. I'll be praying for them. By the way, this, is the, this, this year, we're taking the most, um, I believe we've taken in years. And so God is up to something extraordinary. Um, and I want to uh, just encourage you guys to be a part of this, to actually join in prayer uh, to see what God is going to do. Camp is always a special time. But then on top of that, August is just around the corner. Y'all know that to be true. And so we have a heavy church emphasis when it comes to serving and, and being outside the four walls, as I mentioned a little while ago. So um, on top of uh, on August 10th, we'll have our survey 28, and we'll go beautify schools and things of that nature, love on teachers, all that good stuff. But then on, on top of that, we want to supply um, goods for families, okay? So I want to make sure I get this, the time frame right. So we want to be a blessing to thousands of families. When you leave today, when you leave today, all right, at the door, so I believe at every door, as you exit the, um, um, the worship center, you'll be able to get one of these bags, at least one per family, okay? Everybody good with that? This is what the gospel will do to you and for you, all right? So this is what it mobilizes us to be a part of something great and actually something bigger than us. So get this, um, grab a bag, uh, you know, fill it with supplies, all that good stuff. I like this bag because it's not easy. It won't tear as easy, amen. So uh, you can fill that up, and then if you need to get another one, amen, that's always good too. Um, but then what we can do is uh, you can fill them up, and then you'll drop them off uh, supplies to, over the next three Sundays, over the next three, so the 28th, all right, I'm giving out some of you guys like dates, the 28th, the 4th of August, and then the 11th of August. All right, are we good? Cool. All right. Always got to do the announcements, amen. But all we've been in a series, it's been phenomenal, it's been great, it's, it's rich, and really what we're doing is we're walking through the Bible. We're walking through uh, Colossians, really verse by verse. And just really diving in, just really trying to see exegetically, that basically means taking a verse, a verse, and just picking it apart to see what God, um, with the author's original intent, what he meant back in Bible times. And then what we do is we cross the cultural bridge to today's time. And that's what we're going to do this morning. We're going to do the same. We're not going to do anything different. This is this church. I love this church. We are a Bible church before anything. We want to make sure that we preach and teach God's word unapologetically. And so with that said, sound like y'all ready to have a little church this morning. Amen. I'm ready. If y'all ready, I'm ready. We can go there. So with that said, we've been in this series just phenomenal, man. In essence, we've learned if, for a working idea, for a working thought, if you will, uh, is this. And it'll pop up on this screen. This is what it is. Jesus, Jesus was first. It's the whole premise behind Colossians, the supremacy of Jesus Christ. He's supreme. He's preeminent. All these great words that Paul uses, um, it's right here. It's kind of an um, a easy way to kind of remember that. Jesus was first. He went first. And he should be first in all, in all things. So in, that means all things. Obviously, when it comes to creation, he was first um, with salvation, first from the grave, head of the church, and then also first in our lives. Now, with that said, it's funny because... Um, when it comes to clothes, man, clothes is interesting. You, uh, you know, clothes say a lot about a person. You may look at me today and say, man, this dude is wearing shiny shoes with a hoodie. So you've already made a conclusion 
about me based on my clothes. No, really, this is true. Mark Twain actually said this, that, Mark Twain said this, clothes make the man. Clothes make the man. It's funny because as you think about clothes, what we wear, um, clothes are very intriguing in this regard that trends happen over the years. A lot of us, we're not walking around wearing what we wore back in the 50s, okay, or the 60s or the 70s. Some of us still trying to pull in the 80s back. The 80s are coming back in the 90s. Um, but, but clothes kind of, the trends happen. It's kind of this ebb and flow, if you will, about clothes and fashion. Different styles, right? Bell bottoms and, and all this stuff. Big puffy hair and bangs and just the, the trends throughout the years. Now, I want to encourage you this morning that there's some clothes that we're going to talk about, really, in essence, the, the sermon title. We normally don't talk about sermon titles, but put on the new self. This is what Paul is going to get at this morning. And so with that said, there's some clothes in the first century that the first century Christians that they wore in the first century that are still in fashion today in the 21st century. In essence, you're going to see this in, um, in, in Colossians chapter 3. We're going to be in um, chapter 3 and um, verse 12 through 17. Amen. We won't read just yet. Amen. I like to hear the Bible. That's good. Get your Bibles turned there. Amen. That's good. You see, the gospel should serve as our reference point for life. It's kind of in that video as well. It should serve for your reference point, my reference point. In essence, how we live daily, how we make decisions, how we parent, how we spend money, how we speak and treat other people. You see, the gospel is not only how you and I come to Christ. The gospel in all of the fullness of the word is how you and I continue to live for Christ and to bring him glory. So that's what we're going to look at today, this whole idea of putting on this new stuff and and what God has made available for you and I based on the gospel message. Jesus lived, he died, he was buried, and he rose again, and yes, he is, he's coming back. Colossians chapter 3, starting in verse 12. Y'all better pray for me because we're going to go there in a little bit. Amen. Paul says this, he says, put on then. Now, mind you, let me back up real quick. Clayton King talked about talked on uh, marriage, okay, last week. This actual context links up to two weeks ago when Matt Kendrick um, taught. And so there's this budding idea, but even with Clayton King, it's all one thought. The whole premise, you've heard this already, the whole uh, thought in really um, chapter three is relationships. But how, do, how are you and I to be successful in relationships? He tells us right now, he says, well, put on then. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. He says, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, we never have that, right? Amen. That's just, I love that. I love that the Bible is, is applicable today. Forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven us, or you. So you also must forgive. He keeps going on by saying this. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Listen to the language. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body. And be thankful. Let's go back real quick. Go back to that last slide. Look at this. And he tags his little preface on it. Oh, yeah, by the way, and be thankful. I'll get to that in a little bit. And let the peace, let's go to the next slide. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing uh, psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness or thankfulness in your hearts to God. All right? And whatever you do, here's that that nice coffee mug, Christian t-shirt verse that we always hear about. And whatever you do, in word or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks again to God the Father through, through him. It's just, again, it's very interesting that Paul uses the language that he uses in this actual context. He uses uses very interesting language. And so I really want to encourage us today, if you're a note taker by any means, please take notes. Uh, Today, Paul is going to help us to understand what was in fashion back in the first century is still in fashion today in the 21st century when it comes to the clothes in which God gives to the believers. In essence, he says this, uh, you and I, we have the capacity, because we are sons and daughters, if you know Christ in the room today, you and I, we have the capacity to be well-dressed Christians. Well-dressed Christians. Because of the gospel, we see three key things in our text this morning. 
The transitional thought will be this. Because of Christ, because of what he did, we are adopted into God's family as children, and he provides all that we need. Again, we have to preach the gospel to ourselves regularly because this is not something we normally wake up and just go, hey, you know what, God? Yes, you give me everything I need. Typically, we're trying to find other things to fill voids in our lives. But then he goes on to say that also not only what we need, but that comes, uh, being being a part of Jesus' family comes with some serious perks. Amen. Everybody say serious perks. I'm talking about serious perks. Some of y'all only believe in, like six of y'all really believe in serious perks. Amen. But, but being a part of God's family, Paul wants the church in Colossae, with all the haters on the outside, talking about Jesus, yes, you can have Jesus, but you can also have all these other gods, and you can run to all these other gods. But Paul argues emphatically, governed by the Holy Spirit. He says, no, church, guess what? Jesus, he was first, he is first, he went first, and he should be first in everything we do in our lives. So as a result, there's crazy perks. And Paul's saying, don't try to put on this other stuff that the people on the outside are trying to have you put on. But make sure you keep wearing the clothes in which God has provided for you. So provision is our first thought from the text. Paul says, put on then. Put on then. Notice the language, though. Put on then. Now, the previous context is really like the the uglies, right? It's like put on. He says, put to death, verse 5, put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desires, covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these things, the wrath of God is coming. And then he goes on. We're talking about how we speak towards others and all this other stuff. Then you get to verse 11. It gets interesting. He says, here there is no Greek. And Jew, circumcised, uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is in all and, and is all. What are you talking about, Paul? Paul is saying, in essence, guess what? We are all one in the body of Christ. And what, he, what is he doing here? He's arguing and getting rid of all of the defaults that you and I try to run to and, and really try to find salvation in um, and, and really outside of Jesus Christ. So all of the different things, whether if it's a sin tendency, whether if it's our own ethnicity, education, he says this, here there is no Greek or Jew, ethnicity, here, uh, circumcised, uncircumcised, religion. Then he says barbarian or Scythian, that is um, education, if you will, slave or free social status in the community or in the culture. He says, break all that down, and guess what? Because of the gospel, you and I are one in Christ, and he's given us the clothes we need to be successful and... uh, to love our brothers and sisters the way we ought to. So let's just look at the provision. That's just, I, I ain't even really got going yet. I'll tell you, I'm about to pray for me, I'm telling you. Paul is hearkening on your identity in Christ and my identity in Christ. He breaks down the sin tendencies or the default tendencies in our lives, right? The categories in which you and I tend to run to, whatever it may be um, in life. Our different backgrounds and upbringings have created different value systems. They have. Mine is probably a little bit different than yours, but and yours is probably a little different than mine. The thrust of our text this morning is this, gospel transformation, and this is not talking about behavioral modification. True gospel transformation. I mean, think of the butterfly. Again, y'all have heard me say this before, but think of uh, the caterpillar, that whole idea, that, that imagery, if you will. This is what Paul is after. Because of the gospel, this is not just a great fairy tale. This is God of heaven coming down and dying in our place and your place and my place so that he can transform us for his glory so others can see. So now it's the gospel transformation, the caterpillar, ugly and hairy and all nasty, and it kind of moves a little bit like this. I thought I was breakdancing up here. Y'all better be careful. And so, you know, I almost went there. And so, but, 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 but the caterpillar, boom, and all the ugly stuff on the back of the caterpillar. But then it goes into this cocoon, and it's just this transformation stage, this, this dying of self, if you will. And what happens out of that, you see this beautiful butterfly. But the irony in God's creation, even with the butterfly, is this. It's not intended for the butterfly to go back to be the caterpillar. Have you thought about that? And so this is what Paul is after. Gospel transformation, this is not just merely external behavior modification. But y'all know this to be true. Paul says, put on then, in our text, put on then, as God chosen ones, holy and beloved. He says, put on these clothes. Why? Because you got to deal with people. 
And he's going to tell us what we got to put on. And y'all know as well as I know, where people, where there are people, there's going to be some drama. Look at that hum. Mm. I, you know, it's weird, man, what God uses in our life. It's, he used you and I. He uses humans. In essence, y'all know this in families. Come go with me. In, in marriage, he uses this to mold us and shape us and to pull out the bad and, and implement, if you will, the good. And then what about distant children? That dynamic that happens there when the phone rings and maybe they, they, they pick up and you talk to them, that awkward conversation, maybe the boss or even the coworker. You see, in chapter 3, in our context, this is the context of relationships, the power of relationships, the power of relationships. And I'm going to tell you this. Some of y'all, y'all know this. Some relationships, we all, see, again, none of us can escape what Paul is talking about this morning. So in other words, all of us, we've been impacted by relationships in some fashion. Some of us, we've been impacted for the better. Okay, some of us, we've, it is like previous uh, relationships have caused serious long-term damage. Relationships. That's what Paul says, put on. Hey, it's an imperative, put on. Some of us, we bring joy when we walk in the room. Some of us, we bring joy when we what? We walk out. Amen. Like, whoo, I'm glad they go. I can smile again. When we leave the room, relationships, they can shape us, they mold us, they impact us for the long term, if you will. They have a long, um, long standing, linear um, connectivity to you and I, our lives as just really people. Words spoken to us as children, they've gripped us to this day. I mean, some of the stuff, maybe your mom, your uncle, or your dad, or somebody said to you, here's the deal. The key issue in the life of the church today, I thoroughly believe this. I thoroughly believe this. There are other things as well, but I'm going to stand here right now. I thoroughly believe one of the key issues in the church today at large, not talking about just Biltmore, but across the world, is biblical identity. Why is that important? Because Paul is talking about Christology. If you have proper Christology, you're going to have a healthy um, identity. And if you have healthy identity, you function from whatever that identity is. And so in essence, you and I, we run to different things. And Paul is not talking about just flippantly going, hey, I want you to put on in the context of relationships. He's saying this for a reason. Do you realize that all of the pressure on the outside from false teaching is penetrating the church and now it's causing them to look at each other sideways? I mean, Paul writes for a reason. He's saying, I want you to put on then this compassion. I'm, I don't want to steal too much thunder. I'm going to talk about the purpose of the clothes. I was feeling very Baptist this week, um, alliterating this deal with all the P's. Amen. So uh, hang, hang with your homie real quick, and we'll, we'll get there. But Paul writes for a reason. He says, put on then imperative command. He's not making a suggestion. If you really want to see your marriage work, I'm going to be honest with you, you got to put on. If you really want to love on the people that drive on 26 that get on your last nerve, you have to put on. I'm preaching to myself, amen. Put on, it's an imperative. He's not saying, I'm in this dank cell, I'm locked to a Roman soldier, just flippantly writing things. He's saying, no, I want to make sure that you understand in God's kingdom, you are upside down trees. Let's take a look at this picture. Now, let me get out the way, amen. Amen. So this is us. I don't know if you've ever thought about this being you and this analogy per se when it comes to you being a believer in Jesus Christ. Paul prefaced early on in chapter 1 at the first verse. He says, if then you have been raised, look, he places us with, with Jesus, raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God, place of power. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him. So in essence, he's saying this. You see, what happens is you and I, we're, we're upside down trees. Our roots, they ought to be planted in heaven. Your roots ought to be planted in the place where Jesus is at. Your roots ought to be planted, and Paul talks about these things, plural. What are these things, saints? Well, in essence, it's the, the fruit of the Spirit. 
But in essence, if you and I truly want to put on, as we get down closer to our text, he's saying this, don't miss this biblical identity. If you and I are rooted and our roots are in heaven, our roots are there, we, we derive our nutrients from heaven where the King of kings and the Lord of lords is at, but then also what happens with that? If you have proper roots and proper nutrition, you get some good fruit. You get good fruit. And notice the tree is upside down. You already noticed that. That's not rocket science. Amen. But it's upside down. And the fruit is for the picking. Not for you, per se, for the tree, but for those around you. And here's what Paul is saying. Make sure you, you put on, you put on what Jesus has made available in provision through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Make sure you put on those clothes. Don't try to put on anything else and remind yourself that you are an upside down tree and your roots are rooted in heaven. So there's your roots and your nutrients come from there and therefore it's going to produce fruit. See what happens throughout scripture. We see people trying to put on different clothes. We see Adam and Eve trying to rock some, some, um, some fubu uh, uh, fig leaves. We see David with, with Saul's armor. David goes, man, I'm not wearing this stuff, man. Hey, take this off. This little ruddy little guy, and he, he has all this, this stuff, and he takes it off, and he says, I'm not wearing this. This is maybe for you, but this is not the clothes I'm going to wear. And what did he wear? He, he walked in confidence and trust and holiness and courageousness, but he walked in what God had given him, and it, it was stemmed from God's character. See some verses about dealing with our identity in Scripture. I just want to walk through these. I only have four. I could have had about 20, but um, Galatians 2.20 says this. I've been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. He says, um, the life I live now in this body, this, this anatomy, by God's grace on a daily basis, I try to press in so I can be more like Christ. In the life I live now in this body, I live by faith. I'm trusting in the Lord. I'm an upside down tree. And guess what, Lord? The fruit that you want to see in my life, I want to stay connected properly so my identity is based in you and not in anything else. I want to make sure I put on. John 1.12 says this, to those who receive him, to those who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. First Peter 2 and 9 says this, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. And then Colossians 3, our text I just read a little while ago, 1 through 3, says this, if you've been raised with Christ, listen, it's so beautiful, you've been raised with him, seek the things that are above where Christ is, where he's seated. Now, a big issue of this is really our we got to know about the culture. See, the culture in, in Paul's day was this. It was that most of them in the pagan religion in Paul's day, what they believed had no correlation with how they behaved. So in essence, a worshiper could bow before any idol, put um, his offer, his or her offering on the altar, and go back to live the same old life of sin or the way that they previously lived. What a person believed had no direct relationship with how he or she behaved, and no one would condemn a person for his or her behavior. But for the Christian, being an upside-down tree, you can keep that up there if you want to, being an upside-down tree, but for the Christian, faith brought a whole new concept into the pagan society. Here's what it brought. What we believe has a very definite connection to how you and I ought to live. What makes you stand out in your home? What makes you stand out at your job? What really makes you stand out in the gym as you're working out? What makes you stand out, period? Can people see something different in you? Because if your roots are in heaven, they're going to see some sort of fruit. So Paul is saying, transformation, transformation is true. True transformation is the demonstration that the information has taken root. This is what this is all about. Transformation is the demonstration that the information has taken root. In other words, it's like, man, don't be that guy. Don't, don't be that girl. Don't, don't, don't put on that old stuff again. So back in playing football back at Langston, um, I had a roommate, you know, two a days, you had to do football stuff. It was crazy, man. Been up at 5.30 on the field by 5.45. And, I mean, you got all this football stuff. It's hot. It's in Oklahoma. It's, it's burning up. You have the red clay and it stains your stuff. And, I mean, you couldn't wash it out. It was just stuck in your clothes. And so, man, we get up, me and my, my roommate, we go, we're on the field, we're running, we're doing all our stuff. And we, after that, we, we, you know, we, we run uh, to the weight room, and then we go eat, and then we go to film, and all this stuff. It was crazy. Just a, it, was a, it was a rat race. But my roommate would do this weird deal. 
After all this, he would just come back to the room, take off those nasty clothes, drop them out of bed, sigh, and jump right in bed. Yeah, exactly. And so I'd be like, man, I'm, I'm showering. I'm trying to get clean, trying to smell fresh. But this dude just jumps into bed, funky clothes, and just, and, and, you, know, you know, that good snuggle. You know what I mean? He just jumped in. But here's the issue. He would get up and put on the same wet locker room, funky, stinky clothes and then go to class. And somebody had to, one day in the hallway say, Marcus, ain't that your roommate? I go, no, I disown that dude. I don't know who that is. Amen. I don't know who that dude is. Amen. I don't know who that is, right? I don't know who that is. That's what Paul is saying. Don't, don't do it. Put on what's new. He says, put on. Here's the purpose for the clothes. And our second thought from the text really is verse 12b. He says, put on then as what? The identity is linked, God's chosen ones, holy and beloved. That's that roots being upside down. But then he says this. Here's the purpose for the clothes. Compassionate hearts. He says that you have compassionate hearts. Kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Here's how you and I can be successful, in the, in the lack of a better term, if you will, in our relationships with other people. Effective. Compassionate hearts. That word there means really um, your bowels is moved to, um, towards the, 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 what you see on the outside. It's when Jesus saw his sheep without a shepherd, he says his bowels were moved. He was, he was so messed up. And the imagery for us in the 21st century is when you go down a roller coaster and you're, 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 your bowels are, oh, right? It's, it's that idea. Oh, but compassion just in and of itself is not good enough. So Paul links these other terms. He says compassionate hearts moved in your bowels, but then also kindness is the expression of the bowels being moved. So in other words, she's saying have compassionate hearts, but not just be compassionate in and of itself, but kindness shows the real compassion. There's a progression in our text. It's beautiful to see. Then he says, well, on top of that, humility. I want to make sure that I'm looking at your interests and not my interests only. And then with meekness, I can kind of leverage myself if I want to, but I want to have power under control. And then patience, he says. Very interesting. In other words, um, anger under control. Anybody struggling with patience? I mean, churches, I love church. Church is interesting. I wasn't raised in church, so it's kind of like, man, I struggle with patience. I have no problem saying that on the stage. Some of y'all already stoned me. That's okay. It's, you know, he, he who was without sin, John 8, cast the first stone. Amen. Amen. But I struggle with patience. It's this idea of waiting and, and waiting. And, and maybe, I don't know the context, but maybe there's some things that people want to see. Maybe it's the forgiveness. Maybe, I don't know what it is, but, but Paul says, be patient. And in essence, the idea is this. Theology is made evident in community. Theology, what we believe, again, what you and I hold true, sound doctrine, um, all this stuff, it is made available. It's pressed out and made evident in community, in connect groups. Let me just say this real quick. It's, in, it's impossible to truly live the, uh, an effective Christian life outside of biblical community. You, you can't. I'm going to say it again. I mean, hopefully um, we, we flood uh, to the place to sign up today, but I just want to encourage you. We see it in our text today. Paul is saying, if you really want to make it because your roots are upside down, I mean, your roots are in heaven and you're this tree upside down for God's glory and for fruit to actually hang low so people can be blessed. I can pull some joy from so-and-so's life. I can pull some happiness, if you will. I can pull some, some forgiveness, some whatever, love. I can pull this. Why? Because I'm upside down for God's glory. But it's hard to truly have roots and get nutrients in isolation. And the picture is this. It's not rocket science. You cut a branch off, it's not going to be very long after that to where that thing withers away. That's what Paul is hearkening. He said, man, look, our theology should be lived out in real space. In other words, with real people, not in isolation. We see this in the life of Jesus all day. God incarnate, the word made flesh, if you will. What did the word made flesh, what did he do? Jesus, we can read the gospels. He walked around and he did life with people. We see this principle in our Savior. Isn't it great that what Jesus calls us to do, he also models for us? I mean, he does this. I mean, we see throughout the gospel, this is what Jesus models for us. And so in essence, 
This is what it looks like. Paul says in verse 14, I want to make sure you do this. Put it on, put it on, put it on. Uh, Put on compassion, put on kindness. In your marriage, put it on. In singleness, put it on. In other key relationships, put these things on. The progression, it goes on. I'm going to talk about forgiveness in just a little bit. He says, but put it on. I love what Pastor Bruce mentioned. This is something Mandy and I, we've kind of implemented in our own marriage, but, but realizing based on the gospel, if I put on these proper biblical clothes and I remember that I'm an upside down tree and my identity is in Jesus Christ, I'm a, I don't want to run to the default um, tendencies, if you will. Um, those are eradicated because of the gospel. I'm a sinner first and then I'm sinned against second. But realizing it's in my own relationships on this side of heaven. Then Paul says, on top of that, guess what? Above all these things, he says, put on love. Put on love. Love is the ultimate fabric that ties the whole garment together. He says, this is it. This is the peace. True biblical love is compassionately and righteously pursuing the well-being of another person. What would our communities look like if we really walked in um, true biblical love? What would our homes look like? What would the church look like? What, I'm just imagining in my study, what would the community look like if you and I, we said, you know what? Ah, yes, I am an upside down tree. This is my real identity, not my bank account, not my ethnicity, not all this stuff that I try to hark to. But guess what? Jesus, it's because of you, and I want to make sure that I'm living my life out. What would our lives look like? And, and not just our lives, but around us. What would they really look like, saints? Think about this. What would our lives really look like? And Paul is saying, the the capacity is there. He says, bear with one another. I love this because he doesn't say, just put up with one another. Amen. Just put up with them. Galatians 6, 2 says this, um, that we ought to bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of, of Christ. And then Paul hearkens to this hard when he says, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you. Now, there's different ways you look at forgiveness, unilateral forgiveness and then transactional forgiveness. I want to talk about this real quick. Unilateral forgiveness is this, forgiving someone who has not asked you to forgive them. May not even know that they've offended you. In other words, they probably offended you some years back, some weeks back, some years back, and they moved on with their life. Unilateral. But you know what? Based on the fact that Jesus has forgiven me, I have a mandate based on Scripture, and I realize if my roots are in heaven, God is going to give me everything I need that's possible to forgive this individual. Unilateral. They didn't ask for it, but God has commanded you to do it. Transactional uh, forgiveness is this. When someone who has sinned against you or offended you confesses and repents, And you respond with forgiveness and the transaction actually takes place. Now, who are we not to forgive? Think about this in your own life. Who is the person that you need to forgive? I mean, sin has a way of democratizing itself. I mean, you and I, we've been commanded, and Paul says, if we're really going to get to that last verse, and whatever you do, do it in in word or deed, do everything to, to the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we have to get past this big hiccup in the middle of our text today. It's funny how Paul positions the forgiveness piece. It's dead smack in the middle. It's very strategic. In essence, who are we not to forgive? You see, the gospel is for everybody, for the tongue-pierced teenager and the parents who doesn't like it. It's for the former gang member and the kids in the rural America, places around us, and the suburbs. It's for the murderer on death row and for the judge who sentenced the criminal. It's for the Ph.D. student as well as the high school dropout. The gospel is for everybody, for the girl with the questionable reputation and the person everyone admires. The gospel is for everybody for the boy who spent more time in the principal's office than in class and the valedictorian. It's for both parties, if you will. For the person who wears Nike shoes and the person who wears Pumas or Sperry's. Amen. The gospel is for everybody. Who are we not to forgive? It's for the jock and for the nerd. It's for the person who has a refined social graces, if you will, and those who do not. It's for the Democrat and for the Republican. The gospel is for everybody. Who are we not to forgive? If your roots are showing up in heaven, Paul says, man, let's make this thing very evident. And then it's this reality of really what Jesus has given to us. He said, don't lie to one another either. Don't do that. Because the authentic you breeds authentic community. Will you and I be who God has called us to be? Matter of fact, God is not going to, as a caveat, God is not going to bless a version of you. He made you to be you. The authentic you breeds 
authentic community. And Paul is saying, these are the clothes we ought to put on. It was once said that the dad had a great passion for his son. Y'all have heard me share this one before. I think it's very um, applicable and fitting. Had a son and uh, went off to army. Son was enlisted to the army. He died in battle. But while there, one of the guys he served with um, was a great artist. And so what happened, the son of the father had passed away. And so the, the other partner that he you know, served with on this tour drew this picture of the son. So he made it uh, to the father's house. He knocks on the door. Can y'all see him with this big painting? Has his painting. And then the dad opens the door. He's still weeping because of the loss of his son. And he says, well, uh, how you doing, sir? Who are you? And he says, well, uh, you don't know me from Adam, but I just want to encourage you and just I have something for you. Um, I served with your son. He was such a great guy. And as a small token, I just want to, I painted this picture and it's, just, it's, it's the best I can do. And the father removed uh, the cover of the picture and the picture was almost like, and it's just perfect. It was identical. And he begins to weep and sob even more. A couple weeks go by, the father passes away. So the state now has to be sold. And so what happens is this, uh, they start the auction. The auction starts and everybody's here, about a crowd about this size. The auction begins and, and the auctioneer begins. I'm not going to try to talk like the auctioneer because that is a weird thing. Amen. <laughs> but the first item for bidding was, was the painting. And so he starts, hey, you know, going, uh, we're going to start here, start at this bid, boom, 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 uh, going once, hey, at this price, at this price, one person way in the back just say, hey, look, $70. And so $70, and now you're starting to get this ridiculing from the rest of the crowd, and people are going, move on with this silly painting, move on with this silly painting, nobody care about that painting. Man, what about the cars and the furniture and all this other stuff, some clothes? I mean, get on with all the other antiques. We want to make sure we get all the good stuff. And the, and the auctioneer is like, man, going once, going twice, boom, sold to the man in the back for $70. And then he returns with the gavel and says, the auction is over. Everybody's ecstatic. What do you mean the auction is over? I mean, everybody's going, okay, I mean, just going crazy with this thing. But the auctioneer says, hey, I, 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 missed, a, I missed a small little key point. On the back of the picture, it says this in a note, whoever gets a son gets everything. And I want to encourage you today, saints, know that if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, the purpose for the close is for you and I to be upside down trees, but to be a blessing to everybody else. But we get everything in Jesus Christ. And he always supplies what we need. Always. And then lastly, this progression, you see, it leads into worship, which is interesting. I don't have time. I have a couple more notes on that part, but I ain't going to get to it. Amen. But progression. You see that? Paul says in verse 16, he says this. He says, let the word of Christ, now mind you, remember the roots. Let the word of Christ dwell. That word dwell in the Greek is um, um, meno, and meno means to dwell or to make it your home. So let the word of Christ be your home in you, richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms. This is very interesting because yeah, I always wonder, what, what are you talking about this part right here, Paul? Singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. I love this because he doesn't get all into the, the political stuff we get into. Like, what's better? Is it hymns? Is it, is it praise? Is it drums? He goes, singing psalms, but also some hymns and spiritual songs. This is very interesting because he's, he's talking about literally what Pastor Caleb read a little earlier, like Psalm 40 speaking this into people's lives with thankfulness in your hearts to God, this essence of prayer, the posture of prayer is to him. So why is that important? Why is it important? Biblical worship is not just singing. Y'all know this to be true. Worship is a lifestyle. And you can see this even in the great commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And then also he says, and the second is just like it. It's, it's, you, can't, you can't have one without the other. And if you're doing one, you're going to be doing the other. It's what the writer is saying. He says, and then love your neighbor as, as yourself. It's a beautiful picture. So Paul is saying, in essence, if you and I truly want uh, to, to really see real biblical fruit in our relationships, we have to. Allow the word to dwell richly. Because if the word is not dwelling richly, you and I, we're not going to be really properly able to teach other people because we don't understand Scripture properly. And then he goes on to say that admonish. Admonish means correcting or accountability. I'm leery on the person that's not in a word talking about I got a word for you. I'm going to say it again. 
How many of y'all try to admonish somebody, but you haven't been spending time with the Lord? This is what Paul is saying. If we're going to put on these clothes and, and have this beautiful aroma of worship, what happens is when you and I start speaking good stuff into each other's life, it is an act of worship. And he says in one another, he says to one another, this is one of the one another's in Scripture. And then in all wisdom, not your own self-opinion or opinion-based stuff, he says, no, no, all wisdom based on Scripture. I just want to close with this. I had a couple other points, but I'm going to leave those out. And you thought that picture was pretty wild. Uh, y'all see that? Don't, don't trip. Hey, man. Hey, look at that. And bless y'all someday. Some of y'all are blessed today. Hey, man. Just, just because you saw the picture. Hey, man. It's blessed. Uh, play Pop Warner football. Actually, I'm on the midgets. I don't know why they named this the stuff. Like you had Pee Wees, Junior Pee Wees, Junior Midgets, and Midgets. This, I was on the midgets. So it's the bigger, it's the bigger um, group. San Leandro Crusaders, it's in Oakland, um, just outside of Oakland, San Leandro, whatever. And so this is it. We love it. Crusaders were really good. But on the day of registration, it was always interesting because my mom would, my mom, my dad, my stepfather, Robert, they, have the, they, have the, they would preach to me every single time. Every single time. It was amazing. I knew it was coming every single year. Marcus, we're going to let you know that we're going to pay for this, but... We really don't have the money to pay for it. And I'm sitting there like all the friends listening, they're like, dang, man. Every time. So here's the check. There's checks back in those days. Here's the check. And we're going to pay for it, but with some stipulations. I'm sitting there going, I knew what the stipulations would be every single year based on the first time I heard it. If we pay... You stay. In other words, when stuff gets tired, I mean, when, it's, when a coach is on you and things are not going your way, you stay. We pay. <laughs> and then also, not just you stay, but you play. In other words, we're not coming to watch other little boys run around and play football. We come to see you play football. So if we pay, you stay and you play. Oh, boy, y'all don't catch that thing. Do you know at one point in time in history, there was a registration fee for you and I at Calvary? And it was paid by the blood of Jesus Christ. He paid for your participation in his kingdom. So in essence, he's saying, based on my provision in my blood and through my blood, I know it's going to get hard down here. I know situations may get uncomfortable. I know circumstances may not be favorable. But I want to tell you something. Based on the fact that I pay for your registration, you better stay and you better play. Stay in there. Put on the garments, if you will. Remember your roots and where they're at. Bear fruit for my kingdom. But then also, I want to make sure that you play. You're not here just to sit around, saints. God has a game plan for your life. Paul says, put on then. Put on then. All that. Put on then. Oh, put it on. Not a great ap apostolic opinion or just good advice. It's something that will help all of us be better disciples and stewards in and with the relationships the Lord has put around us.